It is a joy to be together this evening, and I'm thankful for your presence. Glad that you've come, and we're looking forward to a good evening together. Not only of worship, but just opening up our hearts to uh, the leading and the prompting of the Holy Spirit. It's good to be here. You know, I sensed yesterday morning, all, actually all week long, but especially yesterday morning, we had 13 of our men come together for a men's prayer group. It was just a wonderful time on Saturday morning. And I just sensed as we gathered and as we were praying and the way that the Holy Spirit led us in that time that we were in for a, a very real move of His Spirit today. And, you know, you can sense that in preparation for moments like these. And uh, I think the men that were there sensed the same thing. And so we're glad for this morning and the response of individuals who heard the Holy Spirit's voice and responded uh, in kind, but tonight's another service, so we're looking forward to what he has in store for us tonight. So welcome. I do want to, want to encourage you that in our giving, uh, we want to give Dr. Hermes a, a very generous offering, and we appreciate Tom and LMA so much, and we're so thankful for their wonderful leadership over many, many years, and it as I mentioned this morning, it has been a joy to know them for uh, a long time. And I'm not saying that to, to talk about Tom's age or my age. <laughs> <laughs> Trying to leave both of those things completely out of it. Um, but I'm so thankful that our paths ever crossed a long time ago. And God was just gracious to do that. Uh, Tom and my father were dear friends. And in fact, um, I so appreciated uh, Tom's engagement in assisting in my mother's funeral and preaching my father's funeral. And then also Sharma and I had the joy of working with <clears throat> Dr. Hermes and LMA at World Gospel Men Mission. I mentioned that this morning, but our, our time together has just been a joy. And I'm so thankful that we've been able to get this day scheduled. We know that they have come through a lot, and uh, Dr. Hermes shared that this morning. So thankful for God's grace and his goodness, and so thankful that we could still have this time together of ministry before they leave for Florida. <clears throat> so again, we're glad that you have come. Give generously. We want to, we want to provide a, a generous honorarium for Dr. Hermes, and uh, again, just as a token of our deep appreciation and gratitude for his wonderful leadership over many, many years. So it's good to be together. I'm not going to, we, I don't think we have any video clips, for which I'm grateful. I'm just thankful. I don't like video clips, and, and uh, after this morning, I, I like them even less. But it's just, it's good that uh, I don't have any of that to deal with tonight. But I do want to remind you that next week, we will be gathering, Lord willing, following our morning worship service for an all-church Thanksgiving banquet, and I hope you'll join us. It's a great way of just fellowshipping, getting to know one another better, and we have a lot of new people <clears throat> over the course of the last two and a half years, and it's just a good opportunity to fellowship with those around you. Sharma and I like to help serve and walk around the tables and just greet people. It will be a good time, so we encourage you to plan on being a part of that this coming Sunday. I think that's all I'll mention at this time, so if you would please, let's stand together. We'll pray, and then please remain standing as we sing together praises unto the Lord. Once again, Father, we are indebted to you. We're here not because of a man, we're not here because of even brothers and sisters in Christ, although those are wonderful benefits. We do not devalue that, but we're here for greater purposes. <clears throat> we're here because of you. We're here because of Jesus. And we're drawn to this place because it's altogether good for us to gather in your name and to hear your word expressed to us by one who has sought your mind. So we have confidence tonight that you're going to speak to us. And if we agree with that, and if we have come in preparation of that, then you will do your good work. So if we're ready, if we're open, and if we're hungry, and if we've been seeking, 
we know that you'll speak. We know that you will work. You don't confuse us, you make things clear to us. You don't leave us hanging. You tell us this is the way, walk in it. So I pray that you'd speak to our hearts tonight and that we would be ready and glad because we love you and because we want to know you more fully to listen to your voice. So help us as we worship you tonight to have open, ready hearts and minds to your glory and to your honor. In Jesus' name, amen. just think about it. That song is an awesome prayer just to get up every morning and say, Lord, take my mind, take my will, just take everything and let it be for you today. It's an awesome prayer. Maybe we'll think about that tomorrow morning. Let's continue to worship.
may be seated. Ushers, would you come? We're going to accept the offering this morning, or this morning, this evening, but such an awesome message in that song, to turn our eyes to Jesus, the author and the finisher of our faith. Let's pray for the offering. Lord, we thank you and praise you. We again ask you to just bless this offering. We thank you for all those who give we give you praise. We thank you in Jesus' name. Amen.
Thank you, choir, once again. That was a beautiful rendition. And how true it is, Jesus is all we need. Uh, we all really feel very strongly about people in our lives that we really need, and we really do. But the reality is, when it comes down to the bottom line, Jesus is all that we need. And he can redeem us, and he can set us on a path that leads to eternal life. And so I want to thank you again, Pastor Morgan and the church board for inviting me to come for this day. It's been a very special day. Thankful that you were able to um, make a shift and um, that we're able to work this out. And now on Wednesday, we're headed for warm, sunny Florida. And uh, hurricanes are over. There won't be any more. At least they tell us there won't be any more, and we hope so. And um, I invite you all to come down and come by Avon Park. If you come by in February, Dr. Case will be there as our Bible teacher during camp meeting. And uh, it's always a very special week, the first week in February. But we're there with every night, every Friday night, there's a preaching service in the tabernacle. And during the daytime, there's Bible studies, something going on all of the time. We get more church when we're down there than we do any other time of our life. But anyway, lots of church. So uh, we welcome you to come down, and uh, we will appreciate your prayers as we make the journey. It looks longer every year for some reason. Not sure why. My odometer tells me it's just the same, but it seems farther every year. If you have your Bibles, I'd like for you to turn with me to the Gospel, to the gospel of St. Matthew, chapter 5. The Gospel of St. Matthew, chapter 5, and I want to begin reading at verse 43. If you're able, I would ask you to stand for the reading of God's Word. Matthew, chapter 5, reading now at verse 43. You have heard that it was said, you shall love your neighbor and hate your enemy. But I say to you, love your enemies. Bless those who curse you, do good to those who hate you, and pray for those who spitefully use you and persecute you, that you may be sons of your Father in heaven. For he makes his sun rise on the evil and on the good, and sends rain on the just and on the unjust. For if you love those who love you, what reward have you? Do not even the tax collectors do the same? And if you greet your brethren only, what do you do more than others? Do not even the tax collectors do so? Therefore, you shall be perfect, just as your Father in heaven is perfect. Believe it or not, that's my text for tonight. You be perfect, even as your Father in heaven is perfect. You may be seated. May God add his blessing to the reading of his word. I had just preached from this passage, not on Christian perfection, but I had preached from the pa this same passage speaking about loving God with all of your heart and loving your neighbor as yourself. The service was over and I was headed up the aisle and a lady came up to me and quoted that last verse, be perfect even as your heavenly father is perfect. And she said to me emphatically, that's one verse God should have left out of the Bible. Well, that was her strongly stated opinion, but God didn't leave it out. And so even though it may offend a lot of people, we need to understand what it means and what it doesn't mean. For Jesus said, be perfect, even as your heavenly Father is perfect. Now, here's what's interesting to me. This subject, when we talk about perfection, it's rarely considered to be unusual or abnormal. If a student gets 100% in exam, that's called a perfect grade. If a baseball pitcher goes out there and for nine innings does not give up one hit or one walk and wins the game, we call that a perfect game. When that big jet touches down from 30,000 feet on the gently and smoothly on the runway, going in the right direction, that's called a perfect landing. And quite frankly, when I'm in one of those airplanes, I expect and I demand and require a perfect landing, and I think you do as well. If they want to bounce the plane a few times, I can handle that, but they better get it down there and in the right direction and get it stopped at the right place. But whenever this word, 
perfection is applied to Christian experience, people are horrified. And you will always hear somebody say, well, I'm human, and I always will be. And humans are far from being perfect. And I would agree with that entire statement. We are human. Most of you look human anyway. And humans are far from being perfect. And I would even take that another step and say to you, God has no quarrel with that. He understands completely our human frailties and shortcomings and limitations. So when we talk about Christian perfection, we're not referring to the perfection of our daily performance, nor are we referring to the perfection of our intellect, nor our service for God and for others. What we are referring to is the perfection of our love for God, and that's the total context of this passage. This is not the perfection of our head or the perfection of our hands, but is the perfection of our heart. You can have a heart that's undivided, clean and pure, and perfect in God's sight, and yet be a very flawed human being, but with a heart that is clean and pure in the sight of God. Sometimes I'll hear people say, well, nobody's perfect, preacher, not even you. And I, that's really not a very brilliant or original statement, but I like to remind those Alex Smarts that God said there was a man a man who lived in the land of us, who was perfect and upright and turned away from evil and feared God. And he even told us his name, said his name was Job. The Bible also refers to another man in his perfection. His name was Abraham. But I read my Bible and so do you. And I've read what the Bible has to say about these great men of God. And quite frankly, their performance was far from perfect. And so again, when we talk about Christian perfection, we're not talking about the perfection of one's performance, but the perfection of one's love for God. I think an example might be the wife who loves her husband. He knows that she loves him. She knows that she loves him. There's no question about her love. But she may nearly starve the poor guy to death because she's never figured out how to get those frozen TV dinners out of the freezer, into the microwave, and onto the table. And that can be complicated. You would never question her love. You might question her ability to cook, but you wouldn't question her love. I think an even a better example is the mother who loves her children. She would put her life and does put her life on the line, pours all of her energy and her talent and her ability in protecting those kids and raising them. And yet, she may nearly destroy the objects of her love by the methods of discipline, by the method, methods that she uses in raising them and correcting them, and in the process, she may nearly destroy the futures of those kids that she loves so much. So let's break this down for a moment, and I will begin with this, saying Christian perfection is not the perfection of our physical body. The problem with the physical body is it gets tired, and sometimes it gets sick, and sometimes we are under enormous stress. And I don't know what it's like at your house, but at our house I've discovered that sometimes when you are overly tired, and under a lot of stress and not feeling good, sometimes it affects your performance, affects your behavior. In fact, you can get a little grumpy, a little grouchy, a little irritable. Now, don't look at him right now or nudge him. That would not be polite. But that's the reality. Sometimes, here's the problem. We have this treasure in earthen vessels. And sometimes these vessels get rather cracked. And it's one of the reasons I've preached over the years there needs to be a place for repentance even in the sanctified life. Because sometimes we've sp we spoke too abruptly, too harshly, too unkindly, and we need enough grace and humility to go to the persons that we have hurt or wronged or offended and ask for our forgiveness. Years ago, when I was the pastor of this church, I looked over the crowd tonight, and I think there's only two or three people here that will remember this. I hope you've forgotten all the names. But we were having a revival meeting. I think it was the first or second year I was here. I called this evangelist to come who was getting up in years. He was a great evangelist, 
powerful man of God, had been a leader in holiness circles for years. And at that point in time, the pastor always entertained, or I should say the pastor's wife, always entertained the evangelist in the parsonage. So for 11 days, this man stayed with us down on West Fair Avenue. First day he gets there, he said to me, I am so weary, I'm so exhausted, I nearly canceled this meeting. He said, I have big red blotches all over my arms, my back, and my chest. But he said, I thought if I could get through one more meeting, I have a few days off and can get some rest. Well, we bent over backwards to make him as comfortable as we could. We um, had four little kids at that time. The oldest one just going to kindergarten. And we had them tiptoeing up and down the stairs for 11 days. I said to them, no loud laughter, no loud noise. The only time you can make any noise is in the basement or out in the backyard. And we had them under that kind of restraint, restraint for 11 days. We put him in his room, and uh, we didn't have an extra television at that time, so I went out and rented a television and put it in his room. He was a great baseball fan. The World Series was on, and his favorite team was in the World Series. So we rented a television and put it in his home. LMA even served him some of his meals in his room. We did everything we could to make him comfortable, we loved the man, we respected him, and we wanted to do our best to take care of him. Everything went well until the last Sunday morning. And he was preaching a powerful sermon. And he was coming right down near the end of the message. I see Don Starner back there smiling and nodding his head. He will remember this, unfortunately. But nevertheless, all of a sudden, the telephone in my study rang. A little crippled guy down in the front row did not know that the ushers would get it back in the church office, thinking only to help, wanting to somehow get rid of that distraction. He got up and hobbled across the front, went in my study, and answered the phone. That wasn't too bad. We could have survived that. But whoever was on the phone wanted somebody in that crowd. That morning, the balcony, the overflows were all full. And crowd of about 600 people. So he comes back out, stands in front of the great preacher who's finishing up his sermon and begins to point back there to the one person that's wanted on the phone. Well, everybody was distracted, and the preacher lost his crowd. I'm sitting on the platform, and all of a sudden I see the red come up on his neck. And all of a sudden he stopped. When he stopped, my heart almost stopped with him. And he turned on that precious little crippled man and he had this big deep booming bass voice and he said will you please sit down whatever it is it's not that important well you could have poured ice water over the crowd and it would have gotten any colder I mean meeting was out it was over he tried to pull it back he tried to give an altar call but it was over and the big preacher ruined it more than anybody else and I know what some of my people were thinking. Probably some of you were thinking, if you were there. Well, did you see that? He was mad. He's a holiness preacher. He needs another trip to the altar. He needs another dip. He was mad. But I saw the real spirit of that man when that service was over. He literally ran off the platform, down in the front, pulled that little man into his arms and with tears streaming down across his cheeks he said oh sir I hurt you I embarrassed you I spoke way too gruffly and harshly I am so sorry can you please forgive me and little Jimmy looks up in the face of the big preacher and he said oh sir it was so dumb of me I should have known better. I ruined your sermon. I, I ruined the service, and I'm so sorry, and will you forgive me? And the two of them gave each other forgiveness. And that night in the night service, this man of God stood before the entire congregation, never made any excuses, 
Never told us how tired and stressed out and weary that he was. Never made any excuses at all for his behavior. But he said, I want you all to forgive me. What I did this morning was too harsh, too abrupt, and I'm terribly sorry. I saw the true spirit of the man in that moment. Now look, friends, here's the reality. Sanctified people are still human. And in our humanity, sometimes we are stretched to our limits and to a breaking point. The stress can pile up on us. And we can sometimes, and sometimes it will affect our performance. And that's again why I believe that we need to have enough grace and humility that when we have spoken too harshly, when we have been too grumpy and irritable, that we'll go and make our wrongs right. And that we'll learn from that and seek to grow in grace and take better care of ourselves if possible. Neither is this the perfection of our e emotions. If we could guarantee that a, in a second work of grace, that a sanctified person would have perfect patience and perfect emotional poise, I think, to use the vernacular of the world, we could package that and market that and pack our churches. Because almost everybody I know would like to have more patience. Now, here's what's disgusting to me. There are people that are not even saved, and they don't even go to church, and they have a ton of patience. It doesn't seem fair. And there are others, we pray almost every day for patience. Sometimes we pray two or three times a day for patience. Now, you can come to the altar and pray for patience, but God doesn't just pour great big chunks and doses of patience into your soul. It's the nitty gritty of life. It's in the trenches of life that we develop patience and poise. It's as we walk with God. It's in progressive sanctification that we reach a level of maturity where we can find more patience and emotional poise. LMA said to me one day, and again, it happened to be while we were pastoring this church, she said, my mother needs to go to a certain store in Columbus. Could you take me over and pick her up and Take me to that store. I said, well, I can, but I said, you gotta be back by a certain time because I have to drive 100 miles tonight to preach. It's the first night of a meeting and I don't wanna be late. Oh, no problem at all. So I picked up my mother-in-law. We went to the store in Columbus and when they got out of the car, I said, now girls, I was trying to butter up my mother-in-law when I used the term girl. I said, now girls, you just need to be back at a certain time. I've got to drive 100 miles tonight to begin a meeting. Don't want to be late. Oh, no problem. You, no problem at all. We'll be back long before that. So I kind of slid down behind the steering wheel, got out my Bible and my sermon notes, and I was preaching my sermon to the steering wheel. Well, don't look at me that way. If you had to look at some of the faces I have to look at, they're all up in Michigan, I think, or over in Pennsylvania or Kentucky or Indiana someplace. But, I mean, a steering wheel can be an improvement. And I've often felt if you can get a response out of a steering wheel, you are a communicator. So I was preaching away, totally lost in my sermon, had no idea what time it was. And all of a sudden, I looked at my watch, and it was time for them to be back. They were nowhere in sight. Now... I'm counting to 10 frontwards and backwards in Spanish and in Latin and in English. And that got even more frustrating than being late for church. And I thought, where in the world are those women? I wonder, they were girls before, they were now women. <laughs> Finally, they came around the corner, loaded down with packages. Not only had they made me late for church, they'd almost, already, they'd almost put me on the verge of bankruptcy. Will I get my mother-in-law in the car, take her home and deposit her there very carefully? Her mother was no sooner out of the car than Ella Mae slid across the front seat like a streak, snuggled up real close to me, looked up into my eyes, and she said, Tom Hermes, you sure have a lot more patience than when we first got married. Well, it made me laugh, and I said, but you don't know what I've been going through. Oh, I know, Tom, but you know how mom is when she gets... There we were blaming her mother, who wasn't there to defend herself. So all I'm saying to you is, 
I have LMA's testimony. I have it recorded in my brain. I will never forget it. She said, you have a lot more patience than when we first got married. Now look, I'm not going to stand here and lie to you and tell you I have perfect patience. But I, I do know I've made some progress. Probably need to make some more. And LMA don't say amen. But anyway, the reality is probably need some more. So in, in, the, in, the, in the momentary experience of entire sanctification does not mean that we will instantly and automatically have perfect patience. That is something that is developed in the process of growing in grace and becoming more like Jesus. Neither is this the perfection of your intellect. And that's the reason that the saints don't always see eye to eye. They don't always agree on every issue. You put 12 saints in a board meeting room and expect them to always agree on every issue, you are out of your mind. I have been in thousands of board meetings over the years, and I can tell you the saints don't always agree. Now, here's what should make a difference. If we're truly filled with the Spirit, we ought to be able to disagree agreeably and in a kind and considerate fashion and manner and give respect to those that are disagreeing with us. I had a pastor tell me a while back, he said, I told my board last night, that if they were all prayed up and paid up, we would never have a disagreement in a board meeting. I said, man, you didn't really tell him that, did you? He said, yes, I did. I said, but you don't believe that, do you? Well, he said, yes, I do, don't you? He should have never said, don't you? Because I said, no. We've all had different experiences. We've all been raised differently. We all have different levels of knowledge and information. And there are some people you can give them a set of facts, and if their life depended on it, they could never come to a logical conclusion. And again, don't look at that person right now. They're good people. They have a great heart. But they're never going to come to a logical conclusion. There are other people, you give them a set of facts, they'll come to a logical conclusion every time be a wonderful thing if entire sanctification would give us perfect knowledge and perfect judgment. But again, this is something we work on in progressive sanctification. I was listening to a very famous, internationally known speaker one night, and in his message, he told this story. He said, my wife and I had two sons. They were very creative in the way that they named them. They called them James and John. Have no idea where they got those names, but that was the name that they gave their sons. They said when they were little boys, we didn't give them too many responsibilities, but there was one that we gave them. The garbage collectors came twice every week at our house. And it was James's turn on one of those days to bring the garbage pail in from the curb when he got home from school and put it in the garage. It was John's turn on the other time when the garbage collectors came. He said, I came home one day from the office, and the garbage pail was still out on the curb. He said, I went directly into James' room, and I said, James, I've told you a thousand times. You know, isn't it wonderful that parents never exaggerate? But he said, I've told you a thousand times. As soon as you get home from school, get that garbage pail and put it in the garage where it's supposed to be, and you forgot it again. And he said, I turned him over my knee, and gave him a little spanking, left the room, went out in the kitchen, and his wife said, honey, which one of the boys did you spank? Well, he said that James said he forgets all the time and he forgot again. Well, honey, it wasn't James' turn to bring the garbage pail in today. It was John's turn. It was John that forgot. Well, it was, you could have hit him in the pit of the stomach and it wouldn't have hurt anymore. He said, I went immediately back into James's room where he was still wiping the tears from his eyes. And he said to him, I am so sorry. I thought today was your day. I, I'm wrong. I've corrected you. And I'm sorry. Can you please forgive me? And the little guy looked up at his big preacher dad. And he said, sure, dad. Nobody's perfect. Not even you. And just like that, he forgave his father. Well, this night that I heard him speak, he told that story in the service. 
Now his wife was in the crowd. James and John were in the crowd with their wives. They were now grown and married. When he told the story, both James and John turned to their mother and said, Mom, is that true? Did that really happen? Oh, yes, she said it did. Neither one of them even remembered. I think that's some of the beauty of being humble enough when we've been wrong to admit that we have been wrong and go back and make our wrongs right. That shows spiritual maturity and godliness and growth and grace. Well, let me just take one more. Neither is this the perfection of our service. Wouldn't it be a wonderful thing to preach a perfect sermon? What would it be? You'd probably say 10 minutes. You'd probably say 15 minutes. You might say 20. What would it be to preach a perfect sermon? I don't know anybody that had outlines that were any more perfect than Dr. Oral Lovell. He always had him totally alliterated, and he gave the same amount of time to each point in his sermon. Preach perfect sermons. It would be a wonderful thing to lead an organization to perfection. But here's the reality. All of this is a gift to God. All that we do for Him. It's not simply for our, our honor and glory. We do this because God has called us. He's called every one of us to serve in some capacity. And whether it's filling up Christmas boxes or singing in the choir or serving as an usher, whatever we do in His name, we endeavor to do it to the best of our ability. And at our best, God sees the flaws. I told this story at our daughter Chris's funeral a couple of weeks ago. It was a blistering hot July 4th. We were in our first pastorate, and we had set that day aside to do some much-needed work in the Parsonage lawn. We usually, on those days, we'd go to the Columbus Zoo or someplace like that. But that day, there was a lot of work to be done, and we'd just bought this, the new parsonage, and it was a fixer-upper. It needed a lot of help and a lot of work. So it was 90-some degrees. The humidity was high, and we'd been working out there in the yard all day long. It's now in the afternoon, and I'm trimming hedges or something, and all of a sudden, Chris who at that time could not have been four years old, probably somewhere between three and four years of age, came around the corner of the house, and she looked at me and she said, Daddy, are you hot? I said, yeah, I'm really hot. And she disappeared. A few minutes later, she came back around the house, and she said, Daddy, I brought you a drink of water. Now, here was the incredible thing. I looked at that water, and I knew immediately what she'd done. She'd gone in the house. She'd found my glass in the kitchen sink from lunch, still had a little grape Kool-Aid in the bottom of it, and she filled it up with water, and now with water and Kool-Aid. She'd been digging around in the dirt all day, and she comes around the corner of the house, one hand on the bottom of the glass, the other hand over the top of the glass. It was now mud and Kool-Aid and water. Daddy, I brought you a drink of water. I looked at that water one more time. Then I looked back at her beautiful eyes, and I saw this was a spontaneous expression of a little girl's love for her father. And I never looked back at the water. I just said, thank you, honey. Daddy loves you. And I took it, and I drank it all. It must not have hurt me too much because I showed up here tonight, years later, to tell you about it. And when I told that story at her funeral, I was so thankful that I didn't say, it's dirty, that's Kool-Aid in it, your hands are dirty. No, at that point in time in her life, it was the best that she knew to do. And it was a spontaneous expression of her love. And it was totally acceptable to me. Listen, friends. At our best, God sees the flaws. He sees the imperfections. But what makes it acceptable to Him is when it's an offering of love. And we're giving Him the best that we have to offer. And doing our best for His honor and for His glory. And that's what makes it acceptable to God. That's why tonight I will lay my head down on my pillow. 
and say, Father, I did what I could do to the best of my ability, and I have to leave it right there. I will try the next time to do better. You're helping me, and I need your help. We need to have that peace, that assurance, that even though it's flawed, even though it's imperfect, it has been a gift of our love for God. And I can say to you tonight, God's been very good to me and very good to LMA. Oh, he already has two of our daughters on the other side. For a long time, we wondered if they would all make it. But two of them are there. You have to celebrate that as much as you miss them. And we're counting on the fact that our other two are headed in the right direction. So God has blessed us. So listen, folks. When we talk about Christian perfection, we're not talking about the absolute perfection of God. We're not talking about the perfection of the angels. doesn't mean you'll never be tempted again. And it doesn't remove the possibility of sin. Will you say, what in the world is it? Well, I just will briefly summarize this now. It is on our part a perfect or a complete consecration to God. That's our part. When you say that big, eternal yes to God for time and eternity, I'm yours, I'm taking my hands off, I give you my dreams, my ambitions, my desires, I give you my limitations, my frailties, my shortcomings, I give it all to you, Father. And he then, by faith, will take that gift and he'll cleanse your heart and give you a clean, pure heart. You remember that's what Peter said in fact, Acts chapter 15 when he said, God put no difference between us and them, referring to the Gentiles, purifying their hearts by faith. That's what stood out to Peter. It wasn't the sound of a rushing mighty wind. It wasn't that every person heard in their own language. But the thing that stood out to Peter was the fact that their hearts were purified by faith. And I want you to know, friends, you can have a clean pure heart. And lastly, it is a perfect love for God. It's loving God with all of your heart and loving your neighbor as yourself. Yes, even loving your enemies. Doesn't mean you may have a touchy-feely feeling toward your enemies. Doesn't mean you condone their lifestyle, but it means you seek their highest good. You treat them right. You try to point them in the right direction. This love is agape love. It's a principle by which we live, not an emotion, although there is emotion that goes with it. But the reality is, it's a principle by which we live. If we love God, we keep his commandments. Listen, friends, you'll never be any more Christ-like. You will never be any more like Jesus than when you love your enemies, than when you're turning the other cheek than when you're going the second mile, than when you're forgiving 70 times 7. And you know what we desperately need in our holiness churches today is a fresh baptism of agape love until we can love the unlovely, until we can go the second mile, and that we can forgive 70 times 7. With this I, clo with this I close. A friend of mine who is now in heaven shared this story with me one day, and I, I want to just use it here in closing. It all took place in London, and it was a Saturday night. In fact, it was the wee hours of Sunday morning, and a rock band was just finishing up one of its concerts. The crowd now was gone. The rock band was back in the dressing room, getting ready to go their separate ways to their homes. When one of the band members just flippantly said offhand, I suppose some of those people are out there rocking and rolling and carousing around with us tonight. They'll be in church in a few hours pretending that they're saints. And they all laughed. They thought it was hilarious. Then one of the band members said to another band member, he said, you know, a guy who looks the way you look, a guy who lives the way you live, you wouldn't dare enter the door of a church. Well, he said, I would too. No, no. He said, you wouldn't dare, not the way you look and the way you live. He said, I would, I, do, I would dare, and I'm going to go this morning. 
So on a dare, he goes out and gets breakfast, then he begins to look around for a church, and he found one. And he walked in the door, and he looked around, and he could only see one empty seat. Every seat was full, clear to the front, but way up in the front row, there was one empty seat. So the service was about to begin. So here comes this rock singer up the aisle with his long, greasy, stringy hair, tattoos all over his body, body piercings in his eyebrows, in his lips, in his nose, in his ears, every place you could see, body piercings. And with his flip-flops, he came flipping and flopping up the middle aisle. Every eye was on him, and they thought, who in the world is this? He finds that one empty seat on the front row, and he flops down in it. He told me, he said, when he took that seat, you could hear a gasp go through the crowd. That was Granny's seat. Granny was 92 years old. Granny was the patriarch of the church, and Granny would be there in just a minute or two, and they all wondered what would happen. And here comes Grandma, all the way up to the front, and she sees this greasy, long-haired, tattooed guy with body piercings every place. And she looked at him, and she said, Oh, honey, I'm so glad you came to church. This is a wonderful church. You will love our pastor. You will love the music of our choir. Honey, I'm so glad you're here. If you just stand up, I'd like to give you a big hug. So we stood up. And Grandma hugged him, put a little kiss on his cheek, and said to him, I love you, and turned and walked back up the aisle. Some of her friends scooted over and made a seat for her. That moment impacted that rock singer, like nothing else ever had in his life. And he sat there on that front row and could not stop the tears from flowing. And when the invitation was given, he took those two or three steps to the altar. Aren't you thankful he got into a church that preaches the gospel and a church that still gave an altar call? You could go in a lot of churches in London, I can tell you, and that would never happen. But in the providence of God... He got into a wonderful church, bowed at the altar, repented of his sins. Today, he sings all over Europe and all over the United Kingdom, but he sings a different song. Now he sings the gospel and sings about the love of God, and God has opened up a great ministry to him. What was it? What was it that impacted the rock singer? It wasn't the great sermon I don't think he ever heard it. It wasn't the singing of the choir. It was Grandma. Grandma, who when she saw him, she looked right past the exterior. She looked right past the long, greasy hair, looked right past the tattoos and the body piercings, and saw a young man that God loved and that Jesus died for her. And she could not help but express love for him and express how thankful she was that he was there in church. Listen, he'd been hugged by a lot of women, but no one ever hugged him like Grandma did. He'd been kissed by a lot of people, but no one ever kissed him like Grandma. He'd been told that he was loved by a lot of people, but no one ever said it like Grandma. And ladies and gentlemen, what we need today, I'll say it again, is a fresh infilling a fresh infusion of agape love until we can treat the unlovely as Jesus would have us to treat them. And that's the way we're going to impact this world. Not by our judgmentalism, not by our reproach, not by putting them down, not by belittling them or speaking with disgust about them, but showing them Jesus and showing them agape love. Friends, this, that's what this experience of entire sanctification will do for us. It may not make us perfect in every area of our performance, but it'll give us a heart that's perfect, a heart that's bathed in God's love until we can respond with love to an ugly, broken, lost, hurting world. I'm going to ask you to bow your heads for a moment. Our musicians are coming.
And just before we sing this invitation, I want us to bow our heads for a moment of prayer. Lord Jesus, would you help us in these next few minutes? We have the cream of the crop here tonight. These are people that love you and serve you. Put forth a special effort to come out on a Sunday night. And Lord, if there's anyone here that needs to experience your sanctifying grace, may in this moment there be such a hunger within them to be more like Jesus, to be able to love you with all of their heart, to love their neighbor as themselves, and to love even their enemies. Undoubtedly, there are those here that there are some people that are really stretching them, really making it difficult for them to demonstrate love. Would you just give them a fresh infusion, a fresh infilling of your love until the beauty of Christ can emanate through our lives to a lost and hurting world. And we'll give you the praise in Jesus' name. The worship team's going to lead us now in singing. I'm going to ask you to stand quietly and reverently. And I want you to know as we sing this closing hymn, once again, this altar is open. And if you have a spiritual need, if God's spoken to you, I want you to just get out of your seat and come and bow at this altar and ask God to do for you what only he can do and know that he's here to meet our needs. Sing it now together if you will. Just a moment, we're going to have that sung once again. Then we're going to pray with those who are at the altar. I feel confident that there are others to whom God is speaking. This could be a great day for you. Don't dabble around on the fringes, but just plunge in for all you're worth. You'll be so thankful that you did. And God will honor you and bless you. So if you'd lead us again as the altar's open, Join this one that's here, and we'll give God the praise. Sing it together. Lord, renew in me the fire of your spirit till I begin to see the power of your love and make my life to be.
with our heads bowed and eyes closed just before we gather around the altar to pray. I wonder if there's anyone else that in these last moments, you don't want this day to close nor this service to come to an end without doing business with God. It's not the preacher you're dealing with. It's not the pastor, but it's God. And that's what counts, and that what's, is what matters. And so if you'd like to pray, I'd urge you to just step out right now. And then we're going to invite the church, as many of you can. Appreciate those that are already here to come and gather in. And we're going to pray together and believe God to bring peace and victory to every waiting, seeking heart. Father, thank you for meeting with us on this Lord's Day. We thank you for all that's been accomplished. You keep the records. You know what's going on in people's hearts. And we're just thankful that we've sensed your presence and you, you have helped us. You've been here. And I'm just trusting you now to just move up and down this altar. And these precious people that are bowing here, you know them by name. You know all about their past. You know all about the present. And you love them with an undeniable, unconditional love. May they experience your love as never before. May they experience the peace of God and the joy of the Lord in their hearts as they seek your face. It is in your name that we pray. Blessed be the name of the Lord. If there's anyone else that wants to come and gather around the altar, we ask you to come now. If not, you may be seated, or if you must go, we understand. Just slip out quietly while we're praying here at the altar.